All right, guys, we're almost at the end of the semester, so it's time to talk a little bit about liver disease. This is typically one of the harder units. I find that uh, people pay a lot of attention to cardiology, to intracranial pressure and stroke, and even to the renal system. But for some reason, the hepatic system or the hepatobiliary system kind of gets like sloughed off to the wayside. And it's really too bad because it's one of the more interesting systems in the body. And it's actually really, really important. So let's go through, we'll start with the basics. Um, I made my slides yellow <laughs> for two reasons. One, because I find this unit to be a little bit difficult and I just wanted some happy, a happy color. And then two, I figured it went along with the fact that bile is yellow as well. So hopefully you enjoy that as we go through. <laughs> So let's just talk about what the liver is. The liver is a very large organ. It's located in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. By the way, guys, knowing where all of the organs are in your abdomen, super, super important um, in general, but for NCLEX. And I find there's really no time when you learn that. Like I think maybe in maybe in anatomy, but it's so fast that you don't, it doesn't stick. So I would, I would just encourage you to kind of take some time and just, you know, solidify that information, reinforce it so that when we're talking right now, it shouldn't, it should be a no brainer that the, the liver is on the right side. You should know where the pancreas, the stomach, the intestines, you should, you should be able to pick all of those out. And if you're not that, if you can't, that's fine. Um, but just go kind of take some time and make sure you know it. Okay. I digress. Let's go back. So this big, big organ in the upper right quadrant, um, it's responsible for filtering, filtering blood, um, in a different way than the kidneys and, especially it's especially uh, good at filtering toxins and chemicals like medications the liver has a very very large blood supply i think uh, 25 percent of cardiac output goes to the liver and you can start kind of adding that up now we're so far into the semester you've seen how much goes to the brain how much goes to the kidney now we're talking how much goes to the liver um, so we've talked we've covered almost the entire blood supply at this point so so what's interesting about that blood supply and we'll talk about this on the next slide is that it actually has while while the blood supply is large it actually has two different pathways into the liver and um, what else can we tell you? The, the liver has two lobes. Um, oh, here's the dual blood supply that we were just talking about. Um, it has lobules. So in the same way that the nephrons in the kidneys are the functioning unit, these lobules or uh, that contain hepatocytes, those are the functioning unit of the liver. We'll talk about all of that. Um, okay, so let's move on and talk about inflow and outflow of blood. So I know I say this every week, <laughs> but I'm going to say it again. If you spend the time and make sure that you understand exactly where the blood flow is coming from, where it's going, what the liver is doing with what the blood is bringing to it, and so on, you will be able to work your way through almost any question that you get on an exam. So let's spend some time on this slide and make sure you get it and then we can move forward and start talking a little bit more in detail about the, what the liver does itself. So let's talk about the blood flow to the liver first. We have our normal blood flow. So if you look up here, we have our, our heart. We've got blood flow that's full of oxygen coming out of the left ventricle and making its way down through the hepatic artery and into the liver. That blood flow is gonna feed the liver with oxygenated blood. But if you look over here, you'll see that we have another, another uh, set of, of blood vessels that are bringing blood into the liver. 
These ones though, these are blue because they're not oxygenated. These are uh, veins that are coming from the intestines into the liver through what we call the hepatic portal vein. Very, very important. This hip, this kind of vein right here, this portal vein is really important for everything we're going to talk about. But these veins are coming from the intestines. So let's just take a step back and let's talk about the blood flow to the intestines. We have the same oxygen rich blood that's traveling down, oops, <laughs> traveling down into the intestines, it's dropping off the oxygen and then it's leaving through the veins to go back to the heart. But what's it do? What what is the intestine doing here? So the blood that's in here, um, <clears throat> the blood that is on on this side here in the vessels, it actually is absorbing all of the nutrients that are in the duodenum. So the, these veins here are absorbing all of those nutrients and bringing those into the liver. So any nutrients that you eat, but also that's where if you take medication or any kind of toxin, that's, that's, it's absorbed into the lining of the GI tract, right? And goes right through into those capillaries, those venous capillaries. And then it's moved from the intestines straight to the liver through the portal vein. And the reason these are veins is because they don't have any oxygen. The oxygen's been dropped off in the intestine and we are on our way back now to the inferior vena cava and to the right atrium to pick up more oxygen. But I like to think of the liver as a kind of a pit stop on the way. So the blood that's leaving the intestines that is very, very nutrient rich has absorbed all of the dietary substances that we've we've um, eaten that is on its way back to the heart but on the way it takes a pit stop at the liver so that the liver can do its job and the liver gets first pick of all of those nutrients so you remember i said in, in the last slide that about 25 percent of the cardiac output goes to the liver well, much of that, about 70% of that is actually coming through the hepatic portal vein from the intestines. So we've talked about how we get blood into the liver. Let's talk about how the blood leaves the liver. This is a little bit easier. You can see here where we've had oxygen exchange kind of happening. We've dropped off the oxygen and now we're headed back to the right atrium through the inferior vena cava to pick up more oxygen um, and that blood that has come from the intestines is also going to just join right back up into that same uh, large vein it's called the hepatic vein um, that is then going to join up with the inferior vena cava and again it's going to go back to the heart so that's a little bit easier because the, the outflow the, the blood that's leaving the liver only has kind of one way of leaving Let's talk about what happens to all of those nutrients and the fats and everything that we've digested in the liver as it's going through. These pictures here are kind of showing you those functional units, those basic functional units, these lobules or hepatocytes. So if you look here, you can see these, these kind of little, these little doohickeys here are your hepatocytes. And you've got this part of the portal vein that's coming in with that blood that's very very nutrient rich from the intestines it's coming in and it basically is like filtered straight through through all of these hepatocytes if you look here you can see that these hepatocytes are organized in these larger units these larger units here are these lobules and if you look over here you can see kind of a, a different a different view of that. Right in the center here and in the center here, you have a central vein. So all of the blood that's coming into those lobules is being filtered through, through the hepatocytes and into the central vein. Same over here. You just can't see the hepatocytes on this side, but it's being filtered in through all of those hepatocytes and then into the central vein um, where it's going to be taken up by the hepatic vein and then make its way back to the inferior vena cava.
the hepatic artery, this is the blood that's oxygenated, that's coming from the heart, it does the same thing. It all mixes together in here and filters through these hepatocytes or through, through these lobules. So this is a really, really, really great slide. And I wanna walk you th right through it. Because again, I think that just understanding what the liver does is so, so important. So number one, they're showing you the aorta that if you see it's going kind of down down this way and uh, number two you see the aortic artery that's kind of branching off here and going towards the liver three they're showing you the hepatic portal vein and remember this is bringing blood from the intestines that's full of our nutrients and then it's going to talk about what the liver does so the liver performs about 500 different tasks for the body. Don't worry, you don't have to know them all. The main ones are filtering bacteria and toxins from the blood, creating and storing energy, right, from carbohydrates. We talked about that last week. Fats and proteins, um, breaking those down and storing them as triglycerides, as uh, breaking them down into amino acids and so on, and manufacturing bile. Bile is really important. Uh, it aids in the breakdown and absorption of fats in the intestine, and we'll talk about that later. So don't, this is kind of a big deal. We'll go through it one slide at a time. But let's go on to number five. Right here is your common bile, oh, they've got it labeled right here. Sorry, your common bile duct that's bringing that bile. Um, first, it's gonna bring kind of to the gallbladder um, and the gallbladder is really just a reservoir it's really just somewhere that we hold on to that bile um, as we're making it because we maybe don't need all of it right away so that's why we can take it out if we need to but eventually that bile is going to whether it's coming straight out of the liver or it's coming out of the gallbladder it's going to head down into uh, the duodenum. So again, the duodenum is the first eight to 10 inches of the small intestine just below the stomach. So if you remember from anatomy, you've got your stomach leading into your uh, duodenum, then the jejunum, then the ileum, and then you've got your whole colon. So the duodenum is really where all of those nutrients are absorbed. And you've we've talked about this in other classes. That's where your nutrients are absorbed. That's where your fats are absorbed and everything is pulled out of the out of the intestines and into the blood supply. It has to go somewhere from there. It's not going to go straight back to the heart because we need to process it. We need to metabolize it first. We need to break it down and make it useful for the body. So it's going to go first to the liver to be metabolized and then it can go back around to the heart and number nine here is just showing you this um, vein of uh, the blood that's leaving the liver going back to the heart and I like that they call it purified so it doesn't have any toxins in it um, it doesn't it also doesn't have any unnecessary nutrients or fats or what have you it just has because everything has been dropped off in the liver so for example if you have um, glucose that you've eaten you've eaten some carbs you've got glucose in your du duodenum and that goes through the hepatic portal vein into the liver and it's going to be reorganized and we're going to take uh, we're going to take that glucose and the protein and the fats and we're going to make sure we reorganize some of those fats into triglycerides and store them. We might um, send some of that cholesterol off to be used somewhere to, as the structure of a cell membrane. We talked about that a few weeks ago. We might um, take some of that glucose, string it together and store it as glycogen. The idea is that all of that metabolism is occurring inside of the liver so that by the time the blood leaves the liver, all of this blood that's leaving the liver is free of all of those things um, and, is, and is free especially of toxins. So functions of the liver, we just talked about it uh, producing, producing bile and bile salts. Bile salts help kind of help break down the fat soluble uh, vitamins. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So produces bile, metabolizes hormones and drugs. We talked about how 
the liver is pulling all of those nutrients and filtering them. It also filters or metabolizes hormones, your glucocorticoids, your sex hormones. So estrogen, testosterone, all of that is being metabolized and filtered through the liver. Again, we talked about this. It's filtering proteins, glucose, um, and this is really, really important. The liver is responsible for the synthesis of all of your clotting factors. So if you remember back to probably when we talked about stroke or when we talked about coronary artery disease, and I've had that little drawing of the clotting cascade, and we talked about how heparin and warfarin can kind of stop certain parts of that clotting cascade. Well, we're kind of talking the opposite now because the liver is what's creating those those clotting factors. And when we were talking about them before, we were kind of talking about them as if they were bad because um, you know, we were talking about stroke and we were talking about uh, uh, blood viscosity being a bad thing, right? Hypertension and so on. But we need those clotting factors. We need our blood to clot. Otherwise, we would just completely bleed out. And so when the liver is not functioning, we're not getting as many or enough clotting factors. And so that's going to make a big difference in terms of what happens when, when we start to lose blood somehow. It stores vitamins and minerals, sure, uh, changes ammonia. So when amino acids are broken down, it releases ammonia. And ammonia is nitrogenous, uh, nitrogenous waste. So if you think back to maybe high school chemistry, you might remember that the chemical symbol for ammonia is NH3. This N is representing nitrogen. And we've talked a lot about what high amounts of nitrogen does to the body. So um, one of the things that the liver does is it breaks that ammonia down. Um, and we're not going to talk about how that happens, but it turns it into urea. And urea is something that we can, it's not toxic, that we can pass um, through the blood and out through the kidneys and out of our body through urine. And of course, it converts fatty acids to ketones. And this is when we can't, when we need energy, and we don't have glucose, and we start to break down those fatty acids, and we and it releases the ketones. So all of that is happening in the liver. We've talked so much about, you know, when the body doesn't have energy, it's going to do this and this. And we talked about cholesterol and and triglycerides and where those things are going. But all of that stuff all of it is being filtered through the liver and the liver is kind of playing with it. It, it, it. it might form some triglycerides and store some energy and fat. It might use some of that triglyceride for something, for again, for cell structure. It might, right? And so it's constantly kind of metabolizing all of those things and clearing the blood of all of those things or at least all of those things that are, are noxious or or toxins and then allowing that blood to go back to the heart. So I just want to look over here at this little diagram. So we've talked about all that nutrient rich blood that's traveling from the duodenum to the liver, right? We've talked about the clotting cascade. We've talked about how the liver is responsible for all of these factors here. So you remember this now, right? If we look closely at it, you remember we needed factor, um, we needed factor 10 down here um, in order to create thrombin and then fibrinogen that changes into fibrin and all of this is how we cause our blood to clot when we need it to clot, right? All of these things, this factor three, um, you know, all of these outside factors, factor eight, factor nine, um, these are all made in the liver. So it's really important to remember that if the liver is not working, um, our clotting time is going to be off. And that's actually why we use PTT or PT as a liver function test. So right now in terms of the body, we've talked, we've talked kind of about uh, the blood flow then going back to the heart. Um, into the inferior vena cava. We talked a little bit about ammonia and how some of that ammonia 
um, is going to be turned into urea. And that, I mean, that's going to still be pumped through the heart, but ultimately it's going to end up in the kidneys and be excreted there. And we talked a little bit about, about sex hormones and how all of those sex hormones are going to be processed in the liver. They're going to be metabolized here. So you can kind of see this like this connection between the liver and all of these other organs of the body. And I think this is part of the reason they save the liver for for the end so that you already understand what the kidney does. You already understand what the heart does, I hope. Um, we've talked a lot about clotting factors, right? We talked about INR and PTT and all of that. So, so it's a lot easier to connect all of these things now than it would be if we hadn't learned all of that already. So let's go back to these slides here and let's keep going because the next one is going to talk about all of the things that the liver does. And we kind of went over a lot of these already, but I do think, you know me, I'm not, uh, I always think it's important to repeat things. I think that's how we pick things up. So I might, uh, let's just go through these things again. In this table on the left side, it's showing you the function of the liver. And then on the right side, it's showing you what would happen if the liver was damaged, right? If that wasn't working. So I would, I would encourage you to kind of not look at the left side, just look at the right side and try to figure out what would happen. So we talked about how, how the liver produces bile salts. So those bile salts, um, what they do is they, they move into the, the small intestine and they help, they help the body absorb fat. It's a, a little bit more complicated than that. There's kind of a way that the body um, breaks down these large fat globules using bile salts into kind of smaller, um, smaller fat droplets that are then easier to absorb in the intestines. So we need these bile salts to do that. If we don't have bile salts or enough bile salt, we won't be able to emulsify those fat. Emulsify just means kind of pulling it together into those smaller, uh, smaller fat droplets, what I was just describing. So if we don't have bile salts, we can't emulsify those fats. We don't get to fully absorb the fats that we need. Elimination of bilirubin. We're going to talk about bilirubin a lot, so I'm just going to give you a really short kind of definition. So bilirubin is a byproduct of the breakdown of red blood cells. And actually, bilirubin is yellow in color. And that is why when, when people have an increased bilirubin, they end up having like yellow skin. Don't worry, we're going to talk about that a lot. <laughs> but the job of the liver is to take that byproduct of red blood cell destruction and to um, break it down and make it easier to absorb in, in the stool and then be excreted from the body in the stool. And some of it, a little bit, is excreted in the urine as well. If the liver isn't working and it's not there to do that, what's gonna happen? We're gonna end up having a buildup of bilirubin because the liver isn't, isn't breaking it down. And because it's not broken down, it's unable to leave the body and it's going to build up in the body. And we end up with jaundice. Metabolism of sex hormones. Again, we talked about how the sex hormones specifically are metabolized in the liver. We didn't talk too much about glucocorticoids and aldosterone. You remember what these do, I hope. <laughs> so if, if there's something going on with the liver and it is unable to process, let's say, glucocorticoids, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to have an increase of cortisol or glucocorticoids building up in the blood. And that's actually result, can result in Cushing syndrome. And again, Cushing syndrome is just exactly that. It's the buildup of cortisol, too much cortisol in your blood, too much fight or flight hormone. And then aldosterone, if the liver isn't there to break that down and metabolize that, that's going to build up in our blood. And what's going to happen there? We're going to have... Um, if you remember from the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, what the aldosterone does is it causes that 
reabsorption of sodium and water into the body. And so if we have all of that aldosterone, we're going to end up with a whole heck of a lot of sodium and water retention. And remember, when that sodium is being, um, is being reabsorbed, the potassium is being flushed out. If you look, if you remember from my last video on kidney, remember we said the kid, this is kind of what the kidneys like to do, right? They like to reabsorb sodium and water and they like to get rid of potassium. Um, and so, so when you've kicked the aldosterone into high drive like that, and you're, you're absorbing, reabsorbing all of this water and this sodium, you're going to lose a lot of potassium and you end up with hypokalemia. Again, these are questions that on a test, if you know what aldosterone does and you know what a glucocorticoid is, you're not going to have a problem walking yourself through, okay, if the liver is damaged and it's normally, its job is to metabolize this hormone, we're going to have a buildup of that hormone in the blood because it's not being broken down or metabolized. And what's going to happen? You'll be able to walk that through. Metabolism of drugs. Again, we talked about that. We talked about that already. Um, any toxins or medication are metabolized by the liver, and so this is really, really important when we are giving medications to patients, because if we are giving something and we're assuming that the liver is working properly and it's going to metabolize that drug at a specific rate, that's how we that's how we calculate our dose. So if that liver is not working properly, a lot of that drug that would normally have been metabolized will not be metabolized. So you're going to have an increase of that drug in the blood. And so you could actually have um, overdose or toxicity of different drugs, just depending on what you're giving. Carbohydrate metabolism, we've talked about this ad nauseum. The liver stores glycogen, synthesizes glucose. Um, all of this forms lactic acid and glycerol. We're not going to talk about that all again, but you understand how if the liver is not, if the liver is not doing its job, we talked about gluconeogenesis, so creating glucose, or a glycogenolysis, which is breaking up glycogen and releasing glucose. If the liver is not able to do that, what's going to happen? You're not going to have enough glucose in your blood and you're going to have hypoglycemia. Fat metabolism. So this is what we were talking about with, uh, with um, taking in that fat, using some of it, the cholesterol for you, uh, cellular membrane structure, and then maybe putting some of it into, into our nice little glycerol chains with our... Um, fatty acid tails, right? So this is a, a triglyceride in case you forget. <laughs> the liver is doing all of that. It's putting these together. It's taking them back apart. And so when it takes them apart, we release ketones. So if we have um, a liver that is not working, we're going to have a problem synthesizing or or breaking down those lipoproteins, we're going to have altered cholesterol levels. Protein metabolism, again, these are those three things again, right? Remember we talked in the diabetes about how, how the body stores energy kind of three ways in the glucose, um, in fat, and in protein in the muscle. So we're, we're kind of dealing with those three things again. In terms of the liver, the liver is there to break up proteins when it's necessary and then this is very important form urea from ammonia because ammonia is actually pretty it basically it's toxic to the body especially if it's building up and building up and then synthesis of plasma proteins this one here without really saying it is talking about our favorite large protein that we talk about so much when we talk about fluid balance if you think ahead of me albumin so the liver is responsible for synthesizing albumin remember that because it's going to be really important later and then again there's the synthesis of clotting factors so what happens what happens if the body isn't breaking down ammonia into urea well you're going to have a buildup of ammonia the liver is not producing albumin what's going to happen we'll talk about that later as well and again not releasing those clotting factors the fibrinogen prothrombin what's going to happen and that's going to be um, a tendency to 
to bleed. Uh, the liver also stores some minerals and vitamins, and it also, these kupfer cells, these are kind of the, the protectors of the liver. They remove bacteria and other particulates from the blood. So if some damage comes to these kupfer cells, then um, we can see that there's going to be a problem, a problem with bacteria buildup. So these slides here, I just like, I like visuals, so I, I have some of these in here. Um, this, I'm, I, just in case you've forgotten what the liver does in terms of glucose, right? Which you haven't, but we've got all that glucose. Now we know, so that glucose is coming in into the liver through that portal vein, from the intestines is we've we've eaten carbs and we need to break that down now and so the liver is what's going to break down and rearrange kind of all of those pieces so you've got your gluconeogenesis happening the, the creation of of glucose you've got the creation of triglycerides and that's just using all of these things that are coming in through the blood and again we can store it as glycogen or we can break it up and create even more glucose. Nothing new on this slide, just wanted to kind of talk about it from the perspective of the liver now instead of the pancreas. This slide's super easy, it's just showing you again uh, what happens when the liver breaks down protein. So if you look really carefully, it's all the stuff we've talked about the, before. Um, you've got You've got uh, the protein being broken down into, into amino acids. Some of that is going to be used in tissue, and then some of it is going to be used to make that lovely protein that, that is so important, right? It's not just albumin, but a lot of plasma proteins, but the albumin plays such a big role in oncotic pressure that I just, I just want you guys to remember the albumin for now. Again, you've got that release of ammonia and the, the kind of turning it into urea. You've got those keto acids being released when we need them. And there's your acetyl-CoA, and that's used, again, for the beginning of the Krebs cycle, which creates ATP and energy, so that's right here. Krebs cycle is also called the citric acid cycle. You've got this glucose uh, synthesis and synthesis of non-essential um, non amino acids. This is, again, it's nothing new, but let, we're just looking at it from the perspective of the liver now. This is what the liver is doing with that dietary protein that's coming in through the portal vein. And last one, what is the liver doing with the fats? So we're taking those dietary fats, uh, we break them down into fatty acids, store them as triglycerides, or we can use them again. I think I've said this five times now. Um, we can form phospholipids um, in order to kind of maintain cell structure. We can break them down again to have some of the, it's this acetyl-CoA, which can then go into the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle and create energy. But we can also use part of that to create that, those bile salts that we need right here. Okay, so let's talk about bile, bilirubin, and bile salts. These three things can be a little bit confusing if you're coming at this brand new. Bile salts are made up from fats or cholesterol. So if you look back at this slide, this is where the, this is where the bile salt ends up being created. It came from fatty acids, the breakdown of dietary fat or cholesterol. So that's how, that's kind of, as the body is metabolizing fats, it can make bile salts. Uh, again, bile salts are really important. Now, they're, they're different from bile, so don't get those two things mixed up. The bile salts are the things that travel to your intestines, and what they do is they emulsify those large fat globules. We talked about this earlier about how when the fat is in the intestine, it's kind of in this big globule and the bile salts come along and they kind of squeeze in and split the, that big 
globule up into smaller globules and then smaller until they get to be small enough that they can be transported to the surface of the intestines and then absorbed into the venous circulation and, and taken up through the portal vein to the liver. It's funny because this slide says bilirubin bile and bile salts, but we're not going to cover bilirubin here. We're going to cover it on another slide. <laughs> cholestasis. Anytime you see um, coli or cholecyst, we're referring to the gallbladder. So a cholecystectomy is a, a gallbladder resection. Cholelithiasis is a gallbladder stone. Cholestasis. Stasis is the slowing down or even the standing still of something. So cholestasis is a decrease in the flow of bile. But when you have a decrease of the flow of bile, you actually get an accumulation of bile in the blood. And because that bilirubin is traveling in the bile to the intestines, you're going to have a buildup of bilirubin as well. And that's where we end up with this um, puritis, uh, that, that bilirubin kind of comes to the, rises to the surface and, and kind of settles under your skin. Um, that's why you get that jaundiced look, but it's also why you get pur puritis or just itching. A skin xanthoma is just a, a fatty tissue buildup under the skin. It's usually around the, on the knees or the elbows. It can be anywhere on the body. And then deficiency, what you're seeing here is a deficiency of fat-soluble vitamins um, because the bile salts are not breaking them up in the intestines to, to uh, help them be absorbed, right? The bile salts are in the bile. The bile is taking bile salts and bilirubin to the intestines to do their job. If the bile is not flowing, you're not gonna get the bilirubin to the intestines and you're not gonna get the bile salts to the intestines. So again, it just kind of think that through. If you have a slowdown in bile flow, what's the bile carrying? Where's it going? What's it doing? And then you can kind of figure out from there what kind of symptoms or manifestations you would see. Bilirubin, is created again when when old red blood cells break down and new ones are created. You remember that your red blood cells only live 120 days. They're constantly undergoing hemolysis by macrophages in the spleen. So, you know, it's not that all of your red blood cells are are created one day and then they all die 128 days later. They're all they're all created and dying at different times. So it's constantly happening in a cycle. And the place where they go to, to, to lice or to break down um, is the spleen. The spleen has, the spleen holds a lot of our white blood cells, um, including macrophages that then break down those kind of dead or dying red blood cells. When you break down a red blood cell, you end up with the, the protein or the globin because hemoglobin, you end up with that globin. The iron, the iron is recycled. So that's, it goes back into the body and is used, is or into the blood flow and is used. And then you end up with that heme. Heme is the thing that breaks down into that, uh, basically, I mean, it breaks down into this stuff called um, biliverdin and then it, it eventually breaks down into bilirubin. Now, bilirubin is not, water soluble so it it's not going to break down in the blood we need it to break down we need to get rid of it we don't want bilirubin building up in our blood and so because it's not water soluble what it does is it binds to albumin remember albumin is that big plasma protein right and together the albumin and the bilirubin travel from the spleen to the liver when it reaches the liver, it's conjugated. It's basically turned into something that now is soluble. So we have this bilirubin that is the result of red blood cell breakdown. It can't, it's not soluble in water. It travels to the liver, liver where it is now turned into something that is soluble. And then it is taken in the bile, goes to the gallbladder, may stay there for a little while, ends up in the intestines, 
And then there's some some bacterial action that happens there that converts that bilirubin into a few different pigments. One of those pigments, stercobilin, that is what gives uh, stool its brown color. It also breaks down, remember I said it's traveled, that bilirubin has traveled in the bile back to the intestines. It's breaking down into a few different pigments. One of them is the one that gives stool its color. Another pigment it breaks down is urobilinogen, um, which then that urobilinogen travels back to the liver and either just goes right back into the bile, becomes and, and is, continues to circulate, or it can go to the kidneys and come out in the urine. Usually only a very small amount of urobilinogen comes out in the urine. We don't wanna to see too much of it in the urine. You know me, I like these, these visuals. So if you look here, you've got um, hemoglobin. Um, so when you see senescent, this means old and ready to die. <laughs> so we've got a, an, a, an old, ready-to-die red blood cell that is in the spleen. It has been split up into, uh, let's say split in half into uh, globin and heme. And it's easy to remember because we, we call it hemoglobin, right? So it's split up into heme and globin. The heme eventually kind of goes through a few different changes and becomes this biliverdin um, and then some more changes and becomes uh, bilirubin. It's pro when they say protein bound like this, it's because it's attached to that albumin. It's attached to the albumin, it travels to the liver where it becomes conjugated, meaning it turns into something that is now soluble in water, doesn't need that albumin anymore. So it now goes out through the common bile duct into the gallbladder where it might rest, then it comes out it might go straight through. Either way, it goes to the intestine where it comes into contact with these bacteria that then turns it into a couple of different things, one of which is that stercobilin, which is what gives the stool its brown color, and the other one is the urobilinogen, which that's what they're showing is going back up into portal circulation. That urobilinogen goes back into the liver and it may turn into bile again, um, or some of it is going to head over to the kidneys and come out as urine. So this slide is really just telling you what this slide was telling you, except not in a bunch of words, it's using a picture instead. So if you're having a hard time understanding um, one, you can check out the other. Let's talk about bilirubin a little bit, um, a little bit more about this conjugated uh, bilirubin and unconjugated. So you have your unconjugated bilirubin. And that is traveling with the albumin. And we actually call this um, indirect, indirect bilirubin. When we, when we take blood work, you know how it's split up into direct and, un, and indirect uh, bilirubin? This is the unconjugated is the indirect. And then we have, we go through the liver, we come out in the bile on the other side, as conjugated bilirubin or direct and this bilirubin doesn't need albumin doesn't need any proteins to travel in the blood and it can go in the bile straight down to the intestines again this slide is just kind of in more detail saying what we said in this slide and this slide <laughs> again we're talking on once more about this whole process. Are you getting the idea that this is an important thing? <laughs> the reason we repeat that three times is because bilirubin is really what is responsible for jaundice. Um, another name for uh, jaundice is icterus. So just keep that in mind in case it shows up on a test. Icterus is, is jaundice. Jaundice occurs when bilirubin accumulates in the blood. What would cause bilirubin to accumulate in the blood? Well, 
something's wrong with the liver. But we'll talk about what causes a buildup of bilirubin on the next slide. But for now, what's gonna happen if we have an increase in that bilirubin in the blood? Well, our skin is gonna take on that yellowish color because bilirubin is yellow. And here's our bilirubin norm, just in case you wanna know that for a test. There are, we'll talk about these four causes on the next slide and we'll talk about these three. If you thought that you got rid of this uh, pre-renal, you know, intra-renal, post-renal kind of idea, we're hitting it again with the hepatic system, but it's very, very easy. It's, it's really the same concept. Really quickly before we move on, I just wanted to make note of one other symptom of that buildup of bilirubin in the blood. In the last few slides, really, we talked about this stercobilin and how this is made from conjugated bilirubin that travels to the intestines and how that stercobilin is responsible for the color of, of stool. If that bilirubin is not being conjugated and it is not traveling to the intestine, there's nothing there to give stool that brown color. And I'm sorry that I don't have this on the slide. I'm not really sure why it's not there because it's a, it's a main cause or a main symptom of, of liver disease. If you don't have the conjugated bilirubin there or the stercobilin there to cause the brown color in the stool, your stool will come out clay colored. This is how they, they describe it. It's kind of this grayish, grayish stool. That's something that it's kind of a key indicator of liver disease. And I just wanted to make sure that you didn't miss out on that before we move on to the next slide. Four kind of different causes of that bilirubin buildup. So even though it says causes of jaundice, it's talking about causes of that bilirubin buildup because bilirubin is what causes jaundice. So we can have bilirubin uh, build up when we have an, an increase in the destruction of red blood cells. How does that happen? Well, we've talked about what happens when uh, somebody has a reaction to, for example, to a blood transfusion and hemolysis occurs or breakup of red blood cells that is abnormal. Red blood cell disorders like sickle cell or thalassemia tend to have a higher rate of destruction of red blood cells. Really any hemolytic disorder, any disorder that's going to break up red blood cells. If you have too many red blood cells breaking up all at once, it's too much for the liver to handle. And the liver isn't able to kind of process all of that bilirubin that's being released from the, the, those red blood cells. And so some of it may be conjugated and it's be leaving through the bile, but where the liver can't take care of it all. And so that bilirubin is going to start building up in circulation. Second cause, impaired, impaired uptake of bilirubin by liver cells. So in this case, there's something wrong with the liver itself. There's been liver damage and it's not doing its job. Um, decreased conjugation of bilirubin, similar, very, very similar thing in that there's something wrong with the liver itself and it's not conjugating bilirubin. And then the bilirubin is building up in the blood. And then the last one, an obstruction in bile flow leaving the hepatic bile ducts. So that that bilirubin has been conjugated, but it can't it can't leave the liver because there's some kind of obstruction in that bile duct. And, and that happens with um, gallstones. And that's just with this canaliculi or whatever. It's just, it's just another word for a stone or calcified buildup. So that's built up. It's blocked the flow of bile. And whenever you block the flow of something, we learned about this in congestive heart failure, it's going to back everything up. So that bilirubin is just backing up in the liver and backing up through circulation and you end up with jaundice. And I bet most of you looking at this, if not all of you, can tell me which one of those causes is prehepatic, which one is intrahepatic, and which one is posthepatic. It's very, very similar to what we talked about in kidney disease. So if we look at that, anything that's happening in terms of the breakup of the red blood cells, the hemolytic, it's happening before 
that bilirubin gets to the liver is going to be prehepatic. So again, any anytime you see anything that the word hemolytic or anything that has to do with a disease of red blood cells like thalassemia or sickle cell, think prehepatic, okay? And then you have your intrahepatic, so something has impaired uh, the liver itself. There's liver damage, and that can can be caused by a number of different things. It could be a viral hepatitis, um, alcohol, toxins, and drugs. There's a number of different things that can cause the liver damage so that the liver is either unable to take up bilirubin or it's unable to conjugate the bilirubin. Now, you'll see here that it says swelling, and, and then it's talking again about gallstones. So it's not the gallstones here that are the problem. Um, because gallstones are obviously going to be post-hepatic. It's a post-hepatic problem. But it's the swelling. It's the hepatitis. It's the swelling of the liver itself that's caused by this kind of obstruction. Um, that, that It's the swelling that we're calling an intrahepatic problem that's causing jaundice. And then, of course, this, this third one is you're an obstruction in the common bile duct a gallst for example a gallstone and what's really interesting here is that back here you've got these two build up of bilirubin that a lot of the time is unconjugated bilirubin so for example in in prehepatic or hemolytic jaundice you have too much red blood cells there's sorry you have too many red blood cells breaking up too much bilirubin and the liver isn't able to keep up and so what's building up is unconjugated bilirubin. Same with the intrahepatic. The liver itself isn't functioning. It's not taking up or conjugated, conjugating bilirubin. So what kind of bilirubin is building up? Well, it's the unconjugated bilirubin that's building up. But here in the post-hepatic or obstructive jaundice, the bilirubin has been through the liver already. The liver has done its job. The liver has conjugated the bilirubin. And now it's building up in the system conjugated. So, so the bilirubin that's building up now in the system is conjugated. And that's what causes this tea-colored urine. And that's why tea-colored urine is one of the signs and symptoms of a gallstone. So let's talk about some of those some of those things that would cause damage to the liver itself. I just want to remind you guys that when you see the word hepatitis, we're talking about an itis and a hepato. So we're talking this word always just means inflammation, okay? So when we say hepatitis, we're talking about inflammation of the liver. That is not necessarily an infection. It's just inflammation of the liver. This slide here shows you some examples of how hepatitis can occur. Um, so yes, it can be caused by certain viruses, um, secondary disorders, secondary to other disorders. You can have a drug-induced hepatitis. Acetaminophen has been shown to cause, shown to cause liver toxicity. Autoimmune. So sometimes a, an autoimmune disease like, say, lupus will actually attack the liver itself and cause hepatitis. And then you have these hepatotropic um, viruses, your hep A, B, C, D, and E. And D and E we, we won't really talk about. So viral hepatitis, remember that this is a reportable disease for an exam. Okay, you have to report that. There are five different types, but 90% are caused by hep A, B, and C, so that's what we're gonna focus on. They have different incubation, modes of transportation, because, you know, it can't just be easy. <laughs> um, so let's go through, because these often will show up on a test, and you just wanna make sure you know the difference between all of them. So when we're talking about hepatitis in general, um, viral hepatitis, uh, it's going to damage or in, injure the liver in two major ways. It can directly injure those hepatocytes, those liver cells that are doing the liver's job, or it can induce an immune response 
if you induce an immune response against some kind of viral antigen or a virus, it's going to kick the inflammatory process into gear and result in inflammation. And so really, um, the, the idea is in, in this inducing the immune system response, it happens because these certain viruses are really, really uh, like hepatocytes. They really, really, they set up in the liver. Different viruses set up in different organs all the time. And this is just a case where these viruses, when they get into the body, they head straight for the liver and they cause an immune response directly in the liver. That's then going to result in inflammation. So yes, the inflammatory process is going on. <laughs> well, unfortunately, these clinical course, like you just have to kind of memorize these. Um, you start off with an asymptomatic infection, um, only serologic evidence, meaning it's, it's only showing up in the blood work, but there are no symptoms. And then acute hepati hepatitis, the disease hits um, with three phases and symptoms that we'll talk about on the next slide. And then uh, you have the carrier state without critically apparent disease or, or, with, or with chronic hepatitis. So your symptoms are managed, but you're still carrying the disease. This doesn't happen with all types. We'll talk about that. And then chronic hepatitis with or without progression to cirrhosis. We'll talk about that. And then fulminating disease, uh, which is basically just rapid onset of liver failure. Again, not all hepatotoxic viruses are going to provoke all five levels of, of these kind of these kind of syndromes. We've seen this before um, because most viruses and bacteria act in very similar similar ways. You have your prodromal or pre-icterous period, your icterous period, and your convalescent period. We're looking at these three phases for acute viral hepatitis. So the very first one is called pre-icterus. This helps me because remember that icterus is another word for, for jaundice. So I just think um, you're getting all of these symptoms of hepatitis without jaundice. Then in the icterus period, you have jaundice. So if you look at the first one, the prodromal or pre-icterus or before jaundice, um, you have a pretty abrupt onset then you have these kind of non-specific symptoms, nausea, vomiting, malaise, fatigue, stuff like that. And then you'll end up with this right upper quadrant pain, important to know where your liver is in your abdomen. <laughs> so when somebody comes into the ER and they have right upper quadrant pain, you know what you're thinking. You're thinking a number of things, but that right upper quadrant is giving you a good idea of what's going on. And then you have this increase in serum AST and ALT, and I think we have a whole um, slide on that later, but just in case, these are just liver function tests. So when these are increased, AST and ALT in the blood, we know something is going on with the liver. Again, um, we're also checking PTT because this measures coagulation, right? And if, if the liver is not functioning properly, it's not releasing clotting factors, and our PTT will be high. The PTT will be high. It will take longer for us to clot. And then we have the icterus period. Now, now those that problem, that hepatitis, the swelling of the liver has caused a problem with bilirubin. And we've got bilirubin building up, and we end up with jaundice. This is much less likely in hepatitis C, but it is definitely something you will see in hep A and B. And you get that same puritis. You're always going to have itching when you have that rise in bilirubin. It causes just that itching under the skin. So you have puritis and jaundice. Those are just huge, huge signs that, um, that somebody... Um, has a problem with their liver. And remember that one of the best places to check for jaundice is not just the skin, but the sclera of the eyes. The sclera turn yellow. It's very, very obvious. It's just an, it's an easier catch. And then we have our convalescent period. This is when we're returning to normal or appetite returns and the jaundice disappears. So this is the important stuff. We have to be able to tell the difference between all the different hepatitis is. <laughs>
<laughs> it's not a word, but I don't care. Hepatitis A. Hepatitis A is contacted by fecal, the fecal oral route. I can't believe that's, oh, here it is. It's on here. Fe fecal oral route. That's what you need to remember. Hepatitis A, um, one way you get it is from uh, drinking contaminated water when you go on vacation. This is the, the immunization, immunization you get before you go to other countries where hep hepatitis B might be more prevalent. Hepatitis A is pretty benign. Uh, it'll run its course usually on its own and doesn't really cause any permanent damage. You'll have this very like abrupt onset of symptoms. And again, it's that fever, malaise, so pretty nonspecific. There is a vaccine for hepatitis A and a vaccine for hepatitis B. And in the last, I don't know, 20 years, they've combined them into one vaccine that we call the Twinrix um, vaccine. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, we were short in Canada on that. It was really, really hard to get a hold of. And then hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is a DNA virus, okay? It is not something, you, it's not fecal oral. The only way uh, you get it is through body fluids, um, so sex, sharing a needle, something like that, um, or mo mother to child. Hepatitis B can be acute or chronic. Um, it can cause cirrhosis. It can cause fulminant hepatitis with massive uh, liver necrosis. Hepatitis B, you can actually be a carrier without, without having symptoms. So hepatitis B is, is something that it is prevalent in countries around the world. But since the development of vaccines, especially in um, more developed countries, it's, it's fairly, I wouldn't say eradicated, but it's, it's fairly uncommon at this point. This is one of the vaccines that you have to get as opposed to one that you get when you travel. Your hep B, you get uh, um, at some point when you're a kid before, you're, before you turn 18 years old. And oftentimes we're just giving that twin rick. So you're getting hep A and hep B at the same time. So difference between hep A and hep B, remember hep A is fecal oral, hep B is uh, bodily, bodily fluids. Hep A is kind of basically the flu. You feel like you have the flu. Um, hep B is much, much more serious. And then we have hepatitis C. Again, this is another one that's spread by blood to blood contact. So you may have heard of this um, as something that um, IV drug users will will end up with. This is something that we worry about in the ER with our uh, needle stick injuries. So if you if you've ever had a needle stick, and I, I think every every nurse at some point in their career has had a needle stick injury. Um, this is something that you're being tested for. Hepatitis C is the most common cause of chronic hepatitis, and that's including the, the cirrhosis that occurs and, and then hepatocellular cancer that occurs after the hepatitis as well. Um, there are a lot of people who are infected with hepatitis C. It's, it's an RNA virus, which you don't really need to know. A lot of people will be asymptomatic or have kind of those like general malaise, anorexia, weight loss, again, those non-specific symptoms. A lot of people who have hepatitis C really don't even know that they have it. But again, hepatitis C can um, advance to cirrhosis and then fulminant uh, liver disease. And it is a high risk. It puts a person at higher risk for liver cancer. For a really long time, hepatitis C was just completely untreatable. Then it was, um, they, were, they were using um, interferon and ribavir ribavirin to, or ribavirin to, um, to kind of treat the hep C, but it wasn't necessarily curing. It did cure in some cases and not in, and not in others. Um, but now we have, we actually have a medication that can basically cure hepatitis C. We're going to talk about it at the end of our slides. We're going to go through with all the medications, um, but it's pretty miraculous, very expensive, but it does the job. So with hepatitis C, what are our goals of therapy? Of course, we want to get rid of the virus. I think it's so cool that the liver regenerates. So if, if you know, 
a certain amount of liver damage has occurred, the liver can actually re regenerate. <clears throat> we want to make sure that hep C doesn't progress. Um, we do not want scar tissue forming. Scar tissue turns into fibrosis and we end up with cirrhosis. We don't want to decompensate any further. And again, we want to prevent this um, hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer. Some of the hepatitis is, well, Hepatitis B and hepatitis C can turn into a chronic hepatitis. Hep A will resolve on its own, so you almost never have chronic complications. Um, we call it chron chronic when we've had inflammation that lasts longer than three to six months. You can be symptomatic, you can be asymptomatic. Usually one of the first signs is gonna be your um, elevated AST, that's what this is here aminotransferase, your AST, which is one of those liver markers that we talked about earlier. Usually that goes up first. Once you've had chronic hepatitis, meaning you, you've had hepatitis A, B, or C, and instead of going away, it has stuck around for three to six months, you are now at very high risk for a chronic, for chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular cancer. Again, let's talk about these treatments a little bit later. In chronic hepatitis, you will often have extensive damage and scarring of the liver. When we have that scarring of the liver, that's basically what we call cirrhosis. We'll talk about cirrhosis a little bit more, but that's basically what it is. Uh, some, some symptoms, you have weight loss, um, easy bruising and bleeding tendencies. That's because of those clotting factors that aren't being made. Edema, this has to do with um, albumin not being made. We can talk about that in a little bit. And ascites, again, uh, has to do with a portal hypertension and, uh, and, and albumin. And we'll talk about that on another slide. So I just, we let, we don't have to go through that more than once. And then cirrhosis can lead to these complications. Esophageal varices, when the portal vein itself is blocked kind of, or, or part of it is blocked by scar tissue, then the blood is going to use other smaller veins uh, to travel and those veins are not intended for that much blood pressure. And so vessels will start to break or rupture and this can actually be life-threatening. A lot of times those veins will be in the esophagus or sometimes they can be in the, in the upper part of the abdomen. Uh, when that happens, we call it caput medusae. I think, there's, I think that's on the slide as well. But those are two, the two kind of really um, vein-related things that happen based on the, these issues with the portal vein. And of course, we have hepatic encephalopathy. This has to do with the buildup of, of uh, nitrogenous waste, again, with the ammonia. It's not being turned into urea, so it's building up and it causes encephalopathy. And then hepato... Um, Hepatorenal syndrome, it's really not very well understood, but basically both the kidney and, kidneys and the liver fails at the same time. When we talk about alcohol-induced liver disease, we could be talking about fatty liver disease, we could be talking about al alcoholic hepatitis, or we could be talking about cirrhosis. Most alcoholic cirrhosis death occurs from liver failure, bleeding esophageal varices, and kidney failure. This bleeding esophageal varices, if you've ever seen somebody's uh, esophageal varices burst, it is, I mean, it is a, it, it's a fast process. <laughs> um, they bleed out very, very quickly. It's one of the scary, kind of scary things in the ER that you're just constantly on guard for if you have a patient with advanced liver failure or advanced kind of cirrhosis. Um, because once that bleeding starts, it is really, really hard to stop. Interestingly enough though, only about 15% of alcoholics develop cirrhosis. So, so, you know, we often think of people like if you, if you continue to drink over overindulge in alcohol you're going to get liver disease but it's actually a fairly small percentage of alcoholics um, and we don't know why it probably has to do with genetics so what kind of effects 
does does alcohol have on the liver? You have three kind of stages of damage that can be caused by alcohol. You have fatty liver disease, alcoholic hepatitis, and then cirrhosis. In fatty liver disease, you have this accumulation of fat in the liver itself. Again, the liver, part of its job is to metabolize fat and either store it or use it for something. If the liver is not working, some or a portion of that fat is going to actually stick around in the liver and just build up. Just so you know, in case you see it on a test, the word for fatty liver is steatosis. And you can actually see this uh, kind of yellowish fatty, like yellowish fatty deposits on the liver. And of course it's going to enlarge. Of course, it's going to depend on how much alcohol, dietary fat, all of those kinds of things. Um, often, this does not produce symptoms. So people can have fatty liver for years and years and years and just have no, no idea at all. What's really cool is that if you do catch it, and it has been caused by alcohol consumption, because you can have fatty liver disease that isn't. We'll talk about that as well. But it's actually reversible if you stop altogether if you just stop drinking alcohol easier said than done i think though and then the second stage again is that alcoholic hepatitis it's kind of that intermediate stage where um, it's no longer just steatosis but we're not quite at that like end stage liver disease yet alcoholic hepatitis and remember hepatitis is just swelling so alcoholic hepatitis uh is is common in binge in binge drinkers um, because it's caused by an abrupt increase in alcohol intake. This is where that uh, chronic inflammation and necrosis starts. And then you have hepatic tenderness, pain, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, all of those things that we can associate with liver failure. Um, sometimes someone with alcoholic hepatitis can be asymptomatic, but usually you will have um, some of these symptoms. And then we get to the third stage, which is cirrhosis. And this is basically your end stage of alcoholic liver disease. Um, it's usually caused by repeated episodes of drinking and liver injury. Initially, what happens is you have some scar tissue forming and you end up with um, fibrosis. And then you get these kind of nodules on the very on the surface of the liver and where those nodules are the blood cannot flow through in order to to be sifted so it forces the liver to create new new portal tracts and venous outflow to get the blood moving through the liver but this compresses the hepatic veins um, and reduces reduces blood flow out of the liver. So if you have a reduced blood flow out of the liver, it's going to back up. Right? So you're going to end up with portal hypertension. So just look at it this way. You've had all of these kind of fibroids and scar tissue that's formed. So all of the veins and, and, and vessels in those portions of the liver are no longer usable. So the body decides it's going to use other other means of of getting that blood through the liver and to the hepatic vein so that it can get back to the heart but it's not as good at doing that as the original uh, blood flow system and so it's going to slow down the entire system so the blood is flowing through the liver and into the hepatic vein more slowly just like in heart failure, when you have that, it's basically systemic vascular resistance. The blood that's moving through the liver will slow down and will back up. And where is it going to back up? It's going to back up straight into that portal vein. And, and you end up with that portal hypertension. This is where we end up with those esophageal varices. When you have that portal hypertension, and the body's trying to kind of shunt the blood, kind of find a way to get that high pressure blood that's in that portal vein moving through other veins. Um, through They call it extrahepatic portosystemic shunts. Oh, it's right here, right there. Um, and so uh, it, it's trying to find a way around uh, that that portal hypertension, a way to kind of take the pressure off, and where is it going to go? 
it's going to flow up through the esophagus and cause esophageal varices and or it's going to flow down into the abdomen and cause um, caput medusae. So remember I said sometimes it's possible to have fatty liver disease without alcohol. So we're going to talk about that for a little bit. It's basically just fatty liver disease that's not caused by alcohol. Uh, so steatosis on its own. Uh, steatohepatitis is, is fatty liver with inflammation and necrosis. That's right here on the slide. How does that happen? Usually it has to do with an accumulation of lipids and free radicals or... Um, uh, diabetes or prediabetes and insulin resistance, right? If you have insulin resistance, then you have an increase in breakdown for lip of lipids for energy, an increase in fatty acids, um, and those fatty acids are going to go to the liver, but the liver is overwhelmed and can't form and export any more triglycerides, right? Normally, when those fatty acids come to the liver, they are used, the liver turns them into triglycerides and stores them. But when the liver gets overwhelmed, there's just too much fatty acid coming at it. Um, it's not going to be able to do that. And you're going to end up with little fat deposits on the liver. So of course, obesity increases synthesis and decreases um, oxidation of free fatty acids. That makes complete sense. What are the risks uh, for NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Basically, everything you would expect. Obesity, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hyperlipidemia. Surgical conditions is um, just conditions that require many or multiple surgeries because the stress causes the breakdown of lipids for energy. Drugs, is, it's kind of rare, but they, there can be a fatty liver disease as a, like a toxic effect of a drug, but it's just not very common. And then toxins that damage the liver, they damage the liver and then fat builds up because it's not converting, again, it's not being, it can't convert those uh, fatty acids into triglycerides and store it in adipose tissue, so it's just gonna build up in the liver. Rapid weight loss, that's really interesting. You lose weight really, really fast, your body has to break down those lipids all at once, right? So it just overwhelms the liver. And then, of course, poor diet, poor diet and parental, uh, parental <laughs> nutrition. Our fatty liver disease is, is a long-term complication of, of parental nutrition um, because the concoction that they use for parental nutrition has a component in it that's very high in fatty acids. It's not something that you necessarily need to understand, but just kind of keep in the back of your mind in case it shows up on a test. Clinical signs and symptoms of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It, again, it's usually asymptomatic, same as alcoholic fatty liver disease. You might have a little bit of fatigue and right upper quadrant discomfort. Again, you have your elevations in ALT and AST that are often your first signs. Other things that you are going to see hypoalbuminemia. The liver is responsible for manufacturing albumin. So if the liver isn't working, it's not going to manufacture enough albumin. Prolonged prothrombin time. Again, we have the, the liver is responsible for creating uh, clotting factors. And if we have no clotting factors, it's going to take longer for our body to clot. And hyperbilirubinemia. We already talked about this, so I hope you are pretty, <laughs> you've, you've got that down. And how do we diagnose it? We're going to do a liver biopsy and we need to exclude alcohol as the cause. When it comes to treatment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, there is no cure, but we aim at slowing the progression of the disease and preventing further complications. And because uh, because non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is so closely associated with conditions like obesity and insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, the treatment options are going to be very similar as well. Weight loss, um, exercise, improving insulin resistance, and then of course complete avoidance of alcohol. And then we always have the option for a liver transplant when all else fails. The cool thing about a liver transplant is that it's, there aren't a lot of organs other than I think kidney that you can have a live donor. And with, with liver transplants, um, because the liver regenerates so quickly, they can actually take 
a portion of another person's liver, put it into your body, and then that other person's liver will regenerate. In fact, after a person donates their liver, liver function will return to normal within two to four weeks, and the liver will slowly regrow to nearly its full original volume within about a year. When we talk about cirrhosis, we're really talking about the end stage of chronic liver disease. We've gone past um, hepatitis and chronic hepatitis uh, to, to a place where the liver is so damaged. So we'll talk about what cirrhosis is. Um, portal hypertension we've talked about a little bit and uh, we'll talk about liver failure as well and those things are all very, very closely related anyway. We've been referring to cirrhosis a lot over this entire presentation, but we haven't really stopped to talk about exactly what it is. So cirrhosis is the very end stage of chronic liver disease. So we've had something that has kicked that liver disease into gear, whether it's hepatitis or some kind of biliary obstruction. And it, it has gotten so bad that the scar tissue that has grown because of that damage has made the liver very, very fibrous. In other words, good chunks and portions of the liver are now made up of, of fibrous tissue instead of their usual um, very porous uh, lobules. When that happens, it's, it's basically completely replaced all of the functional liver tissue that was there. Sometimes I imagine it like almost like calluses. So these little nodules build up on the surface of the liver and the hepatocytes are basically suffocated by the fibroids. This fibrous or scar tissue can form these, um, these kind of bands that, that wrap around portions of the liver and constrict blood flow and biliary flow. Etiology of cirrhosis, we've really been talking about this entire presentation. So alcoholic fatty liver disease, viral hepatitis, um, a toxic reaction to a drug or chemicals, a biliary obstruction that wasn't dealt with quickly enough, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And there are these two kind of uh, metabolic disorders that you don't need to know for your exam, hemochromatosis and Wilson's disease. So I'm not even going to go through them because it's just extra information that you don't need right now. And clinical manifestations is going to range from asymptomatic hepatos hepatomegaly. So basically, you, you don't have really symptoms on the outside, but if somebody were to do an, an exam, they would feel kind of the edge of your liver below, this, below the rib where it's not supposed to be. You may have splenomegaly as well. Sometimes they combine those words into hepatosplenomegaly. So if you see that on exam, it's just relating to both liver and spleen enlargement. So while you have these some people who are pretty much asymptomatic, then you can have some people who are in complete, um, complete liver failure. With the liver, and I, I think this has kind of been the theme as we've been talking through, there really are no symptoms until, until it's very advanced. You can get very far into liver disease before you have any idea that there is something going on. Um, oftentimes people will lose weight, but unfortunately that can be masked by ascites. We'll talk about ascites in the next couple of slides, but it's basically the um, water weight. It's, it's, it's fluid shifting into the peritoneal cavity. And so it may, uh, it may even look like you're gaining weight, uh, but it really is all just fluid accumulating in that peritoneal cavity. Things like weakness, anorexia, again, some of those more nonspecific um, signs. And of course, you have your hepatomegaly or your hepatosplenomegaly and jaundice. Usually by the time the jaundice shows up, it's gotten fairly far. And same with abdominal pain, um, right upper quadrant abdominal pain and epigastric, kind of a dull aching and a sensation of fullness. So all of those things can be earlier signs um, i would say you know once you get to kind of jaundice and and right upper quadrant pain you're kind of into the more intermediate signs uh, but again nothing is textbook in the real world so the later signs then uh, would be more related to this portal hypertension and the actual failure of the liver so we talked about how that how that hypertension is is going to come about 
Um, at this point, you're going to most definitely have splenomegaly, meaning that portal vein has backed up right into the splenic artery. If you remember from earlier when we looked at one of the slides had kind of a, a diagram of the blood flow going to the liver. If you look closely, you'd see that we have the aorta that's coming down. Let's say you have your liver over here and you've got your spleen over here. The hepatic artery branches off like this and then the splenic artery branches off kind of like this. So when blood starts to backflow through the hepatic artery, it doesn't take very long before it's backflowing all the way through the splenic artery into the spleen as well. We'll talk about um, ascites in more detail in a couple of slides. And then we have talked about these portal systemic shunts. Again, the body is trying to get some of that blood moving. Uh, the portal vein is, is backed up. It's moving slowly. There's too much pressure for the portal vein. When that happens, the body will try to compensate, try to, to find other ways for the blood to get where it needs to be and ways to kind of relieve the pressure on the portal vein. And so it will shunt some of that blood upward towards the esophagus. The, the veins in the esophagus are not made for that kind of high pressure. This, so they're at risk of, of, of rupturing, bursting. And then some of that blood might be shunted downwards uh, and this is where you will end up with, again, you've got these veins in your abdomen that are perfectly fine for what they're made for, but they're not made for that kind of high pressure. And so the same thing happens. They get kind of rounded out and swollen and also are at risk of rupturing. And then you can have that shunting all the way down into the rectum and anus where you end up with those veins kind of swelling up into hemorrhoids as well. So that's just, you know, that's just kind of showing you the portosystemic shunts. We also have other manifestations of cirrhosis, uh, bleeding, and that's again because of your decreased clotting factors, thrombocytopenia. So um, the spleen is responsible for kind of, it's almost like a reservoir for your platelets. And so when the spleen isn't doing its job, it's damaged now, you're gonna see a drop in your thrombocytes or platelets. Um, gynecomastia, that is because the liver is responsible for metabolizing sex hormones. There is a, a buildup of estrogen and we can have breasts or breast buds that develop on a, a male. Um, testicular atrophy, again, same thing with the sex hormones and um, spider angiomas. We've talked about things that are going on in the venous system. Palmar erythema is, is just kind of a, a really strange side effect of increased estrogen. So it's just kind of one you have to remember. And then encephalopathy, we will talk about. We'll talk about all of this. But um, a lot of this has to do with uh, the buildup of toxins in the system. Remember, the liver is responsible for clearing your body of any toxins. If it's not working, those are going to build up. And especially, we've talked about ammonia and the liver's responsibility in clearing that from the system. If the liver's not working, it's unable to, to clear that ammonia. Um, eventually, it will build up enough to cause encephalopathy. Any increased resistance or obstruction or anything that's going to slow down the blood flow through the liver is gonna increase the pressure in the portal vein. Again, it can have prehepatic, post-hepatic, and intrahepatic causes. And some of the major complications of portal hypertension are the things we've talked about. So ascites, splenomegaly, and formation of portosystemic shunts with bleeding from esophageal varices. Really, it's this, it's this portal hypertension that usually that happens first that's then causing these other things we've talked about, the ascites, the splenomegaly, and the uh, portosystemic shunting. And this is just a great little infographic showing you exactly what we just talked about. I find these really, really helpful. So if you're struggling at all with kind of what comes first um, and how how these things are, how one thing is causing the other, um, this little infographic is a great thing to, to check out. What is ascites? 
textbook definition, accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity. You remember that many of your organs are held in a sort of sac. So your heart, your heart, for example, is in a pericardial sac. Your lungs, <laughs> your lungs are in a pleural sac and your abdominal organs. So your liver, intestines, spleen, pancreas, stomach, gallbladder, those are all in kind of sharing one sac and it's uh, the peritoneal, the peritoneal sac. So you've got all those organs kind of in here. I'm not drawing them properly. Um, there's, there's your intestines. <laughs> and so when you have that backup from the portal vein and you have a, the blood flowing slowly, there are a few different things going on here that are contributing to this accumulation of fluid inside the peritoneal cavity. The first one is that portal hypertension. So you have, first you have all of this fibrous tissue on the liver, which is slowing down the blood flow through the liver. Then you have portal hypertension, where the systemic vascular resistance within that portal system is high. And so you have hydrostatic pressure. Remember we talked about whenever you have too much blood or you have a very viscous blood, how it will put so much pressure on those veins. It starts to push fluids out of the vein and into the interstitial spaces, right? We've talked about this a lot. Um, this is called hydrostatic pressure and definitely something you want to know for your final. It's one of those things that, that, that affects, I think we've brought it up in almost every unit we've talked about. But at the same time, and this is, this is really important, remember we said that the liver was responsible for creating albumin. And I said that albumin is, is one of the proteins in our blood that is, is uh, pl it plays a huge role in maintaining oncotic pressure. Oncotic pressure is something that is, it's basically working against this hydrostatic pressure. I'll walk you through it. Again, we've got, um, we've got this, this vein or capillary or blood vessel of some sort, and we've got a lot, a lot, a lot of blood in here going quickly, and so we have hydrostatic pressure pushing that blood out, um, out and into the interstitial space. Normally, we have quite a lot of albumin inside of the blood vessel as well. And I know we've talked about this before, one of the things that albumin does, because it's a very large protein, it actually pulls fluids toward it. So it's, while, while you've got all this high pressure blood being pushed out of the vein because through hydrostatic pressure, you still have this, some of this fluid being pulled back into the, the vasculature because of the pull from all of these large proteins. And that pressure, the pressure that pulls, the pressure that's based on osmolarity basically, or, or, or the, the number of or size of proteins, that is oncotic pressure. And those two things are basically working against each other to maintain a balance. Unfortunately, what's happened here is not only do we have high pressure going through this portal vein and, and pushing out, causing hydrostatic pressure and pushing out fluid into the peritoneal cavity, we also have a decrease in albumin because the liver is responsible for synthesizing albumin. And when it's not working properly, we're gonna have a whole lot less albumin in that vasculature to kind of balance that hydrostatic pressure and pull some of that blood in. So this kind of weakens. You don't really have this, this oncotic pressure pulling that fluid back in. So you've got two pressures that are contributing to this increased fluid in the peritoneal cavity. You have the hydrostatic pressure that's from, from the blood flow that's pushing out and you have the lack of or the loss of that oncotic pressure that's just allowing that fluid to come out without anything kind of fighting against it. And so sometimes you, you have to remember too that your kidneys are often affected. We often have that um, hepatorenal disease. And so what do the kidneys do? 
the kidneys are responsible for sodium and water retention and, and potassium excretion. And now you've got extra kind of extra sodium and water uh, retention by the kidneys. And that has to do with the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system having kicked in because of some, uh, or in part because of the loss of all of this fluid. The fluid's no longer in the vasculature. It's not coming, it's not making its way to the kidney. And when there's low, low fluid volume, that's gonna kick in the RAAS very, very quickly. We're gonna have aldosterone and that's gonna increase the uptake of sodium and water. And so now you have all of this extra, this extra sodium and water that's just going to be, continue to be pushed out into the peritoneal cavity. So if you've ever seen a patient with ascites, um, you know, it's, it's usually fairly obvious that their, their abdomen is quite large and you can actually feel, um, if you feel around lightly, you can feel almost a rippling effect because it's just, it's just all fluid. How do we treat ascites? We're going to restrict sodium um, and usually uh, fluids as well. We're going to give diuretics. Diuretics are going to pull some of that fluid out and excrete it in the urine. We talked about on the last slide how we've kicked the uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system into high gear. What's it going to do? It increases sodium and water retention, um, but it also increases potassium excretion. So we may be suffering now from um, hypokalemia, um, which means we may need to supply oral potassium supplements. Sometimes we can do a paracentesis. You basically go in with um, almost like a chest tube, but it's a different tube. We go in and we will just pull that fluid out. And sometimes this will have to be done over and over and over again. And then we have the TIPS procedure. You probably won't have to know this for your exam, but it's basically a, a, a shunt that shunts the blood. Um, it bypasses the liver, and that way we can reduce some of the pressure in that portal vein. We've talked about splenomegaly and why the spleen is enlarging along with the liver. That has a lot to do with blood flow. This hyper uh, splenism syndrome, it's what happens when when the spleen is damaged for long periods of time. We have a decrease in the lifespan and the numbers of all of your blood elements, right? Because when your white blood cells, your platelets, your red blood cells are all kind of stored in that, uh, in that spleen. And so when the spleen isn't functioning properly, we're going to have basically pancytopenia, we're going to have anemia, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, everything, um, all of those uh, blood cells that are supposed to be stored there are going to be decreased significantly. We have talked already a lot about these portosystemic shunts and how they cause, really all you need to remember is that it's going to shunt up to the esophagus, to the rectum, and across to some of the umbilical veins. The umbilical veins we call caput medusae, the esophageal, esophageal varices. The esophageal varices have a high risk of rupturing and um, if I think I've talked about this already, but if you've ever seen this happen in real life, it, you hemorrhage very, very quickly and it is often fatal. There are a few things that they can do to, uh, to treat esophageal varices. None of them are very pleasant at all. How do we treat portal hypertension and esophageal varices? A lot of this has to do with prevention. Uh, we want to make sure that we are preventing the chances of a hemorrhage. If a hemorrhage does occur, we need to manage that hemorrhage. Preventing a, a hemorrhage involves a mostly pharmaco pharmacologic therapy to lower the portal venous pressure, so beta blockers. Uh, propanolol is very, very popular for that. If we can reduce some of that blood pressure in the portal vein, then we're going to reduce the amount of, of blood that is being shunted up into the esophagus. How do we control the hemorrhage? We can administer octreotide or vasopressin. Really, all you need to know about those is that they are going to uh, decrease blood pressure very quickly. A balloon tamponade 
this is kind of what I was talking about on the last slide where I said it's not very much fun. Um, it's almost like, almost like uh, an angioplasty where they put kind of a, a long balloon-like instrument down the esophagus um, and then blow it up or inflate it so that it puts pressure on all of those varices that are bleeding. And it, we have to hold that like that until the bleeding stops. And I wouldn't worry about this endoscopic injection sclerotherapy for now. We've talked about most of these already, these kind of treatment strategies. Remember we talked about the TIPS procedure and how it, what we do is we insert an expandable metal stent between the hepatic vein and the portal vein. We're basically shunting that blood around the liver. So remember that the liver is responsible for metabolizing and decreasing or, or dealing with the toxins that are in our body, namely, again, the ammonia. And so when we bypass the liver, we may be allowing some of those neurotoxic substances to build up. Because that ammonia is it's a nitrogenous waste, it's gonna have a great effect on the brain, and this is where we end up with um, hepatic encephalopathy. I think while we're chatting about this, you know, people, uh, people see hepatic encephalopathy and without kind of knowledge of, of what's going on behind the scenes, it seems counterintuitive. It seems like those two systems are so, are kind of unrelated, but remember none of the systems in the body are unrelated. Um, and so it's because of this, largely because of this ammonia buildup that we end up with encephalopathy. And so after all of this has happened, we typically are going to end up in liver failure. And liver failure is very, very similar to kidney failure. We've talked about uh, a lot. It can be uh, basically a, a very sudden destruction of the liver or, or fulminant hepatitis, or it can be progressive like in alcoholic cirrhosis. This slide really is, is so, so similar to some of the slides that we have in, in the renal when we went over kidney function, you can have a sudden liver destruction. So for example, you have a hepatitis B, becomes fulminant hepatitis very, very quickly, and you have that um, sudden liver, liver failure, similar to your AKI. Or you can have progressive liver damage for example, caused by non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that could take uh, some time to, to, become, to come to the point where we would call it liver failure. And that was, sounds a whole lot like chronic kidney disease. And then again, very, very similarly, we're only going to uh, hit that, that threshold of liver failure when we've lost 80 to 90 percent of hepatic function, which again is very, very similar to kidney disease. Manifestations, we have talked about literally all of this. Uh, all of the hemat hematologic things related to the spleen, anemia, thrombocytopenia, coagulation that's related to the liver and not making coagulation factors, leukopenia again with the spleen, Endocrine, we've talked about how this is related to our sex hormones. We've talked about how it's also related to um, our aldosterone and how it can cause sodium and water retention by the kidney kidneys and how it can lower potassium. We've talked about hepatic encephalopathy. What causes that? It's the buildup in your ammonia. Um, what does it look like? It, it looks like, as we talked about a lot in our neuro unit, it looks like a change in the level of consciousness. Uh, one, of an, one of the early signs is this um, asterixis. And that's just one of those words you kind of have to know. Uh, it's, it's, you know what, if you just kind of memorize it as a flapping tremor, that will help. Um, it's, it's basically the patient has the inability to stop kind of flapping their arms. Uh, memory loss, personality changes, these are all things that make sense with a neurological change. You may have euphoria or irritability. <laughs> Maybe you're swinging back and forth between both. Maybe you have emotional ability, um, anxiety, lack of concern for appearance and self, impaired speech. Again, this is something where we need to run diagnostics to uh, differentiate between maybe a sudden uh, liver failure and stroke.
And then, of course, we may progress to uh, decerebrate rigidity and coma. And I'll let you look over your notes again from our neural unit to um, refresh your mind on what decerebrate posturing is. So if you are understanding everything fairly well, you're not struggling, you don't need a nice summary, feel free to skip to the next slide. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go through this slide because I think it's a really, really great summary of everything that we've talked about. Um, again, feel free to skip forward if you need to. So liver failure, and rather, whether this is progressive or sudden, liver failure is liver failure. This is what's going to happen. They've separated the, the disorders or the manifestations up into things that are happening because of the liver's synthesis and storage function and because of the liver's kind of metabolic and excretory functions. In other words, what's going to go wrong based on the liver's job to store things and make things and then based on the liver's job to metabolize and excrete things. So over here on the left, we have glucose. We know that the liver is responsible for gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. The liver's not working. That's not happening. We're going to end up with hypoglycemia. We're not making enough glucose. The liver is also um, responsible for synthesizing larger proteins like albumin and coagulation factors. When the liver is failing, that is not happening. So it's not creating that hypo, that albumin and you end up with hypoalbuminemia and as a result of the hypoalbuminemia or at least in part as a result we're going to end up with edema and ascites again because coagulation factors are really just proteins so a, another uh, another manifestation of not uh, being able to synthesize proteins is that we are going to have a decrease in those coagulation factors. And you can't see down here, it's just a little bit skewed, but we're gonna, that is gonna result in increased bleeding and bruising. One of the other things in terms of synthesis and storage that the liver does is it synthesizes cholesterol. It takes the fatty acids and, and, and triglycerides and rearranges them and uses them um, and, or stores them. And so we end up with a decreased cholesterol. Um, and then remember that one of the other things, so these three are things that we've covered, glucose, protein, and, and fats or lipoprotein are things that we've covered in previous units. The one thing that the liver is going to synthesize that is is new to this unit is um, the bile salts and remember that bile salts are there to help the intestines absorb fat so if the bile salts are gone or they are decreased the body is unable to absorb that fat and we're going to have those uh, fatty stools and we're going to have a deficiency in fat soluble vitamins so let's look over on the right side here and we're going to talk about what the liver does in terms of metabolism and, and excreting things from the body. In terms of amino acids, the most important thing here is that the, the liver normally takes that ammonia and converts it to urea so that it can be um, excreted from the body. That's not happening. So we end up with this buildup of ammonia and hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, then we can move on to steroid hormones, aldosterone and your sex hormones. If the liver isn't metabolizing these hormones, you're going to have a buildup of them in your system. So let's talk about aldosterone first. What does aldosterone do? It's going to cause uh, an, a reabsorption, an increased reabsorption of sodium and water in, or sodium and fluid in the kidney and a loss of potassium. So we're going to end up contributing further to edema and ascites. And in terms of the sex hormones, we now have increased androgen and estrogen hormones because they're not being metabolized. In males, this will look like uh, gynecomastia, and which again is that development of breasts. And in women, it will look like a menstrual irregularity. The other uh, thing that the liver does in terms of metabolism is it metabolizes drugs and toxins. If that is not happening, you are going to have a buildup of those drugs and toxins in your body. This is something to be aware of as a nurse when you are administering medications. And then 
Last, but definitely not least, we're gonna have a buildup of that bilirubin. So normally the liver takes that byproduct of red blood cell destruction and makes it something that can be excreted in the bile and in the stool and, some, and a bit through the urine. If that's not happening, you have a buildup of that bilirubin and you end up with hyperbilirubinemia and again, jaundice. So this is a really, really great slide. It covers, I think, almost everything I can think of or everything we've talked about throughout the unit. Everything we see here on this slide for treatment of liver failure makes complete sense. So I'll just let you read through that on your own. Really, ultimately, uh, this kind of liver failure, the ultimate treatment is going to be a liver transplant. There really isn't anything that we can do to turn this around. Back when we talked about hepatitis C, you remember I said we, we used to treat with um, interferon um, and a, few, a, a couple of other things and how it really wasn't very effective, but that we've developed in recent years this kind of miracle drug, Harvoni. This is the drug. What it does is it, it basically stops the hepatitis C virus from replicating. It's a combination of two different you know, antivirals. You don't need to memorize those or know those. I think the most important thing here to, to know is that this is something that has shown great success in eliminating hepatitis C from the body. Uh, it is very expensive, so that's kind of a bit of a, a, it's a, bit of a downer. It will be a little bit easier to access. Uh, common side effects, fatigue and headache. So nothing too complicated. One of the other things we might use to treat liver failure, liver disease, is spironolactone. You know what spironolactone is. Just think it through. We have all of this fluid retention going on, and we already have a loss of potassium. So right there, we want to make sure that we're, we're using a potassium-sparing uh, diuretic. This is a fairly easy medication that we covered either in the fall or at, at some other point. And so you can just go back and take a look at it. There's nothing super complicated about it. Just remember that we don't want to have a diet that is high in potassium while we're on it, right? Because the kidney is supposed to be excreting potassium. We're kind of slowing that down. So we're already gonna have extra potassium. We don't wanna be eating a bunch of green leafy vegetables and bananas on top of that. Hyperosmotic uh, laxatives, we have probably all given this. This is just your regular old lactulose. Why would we use this in the treatment of liver disease? Well, as the name suggests, it's gonna create a hyperosmotic environment in the intestines. What that's gonna do is it's going to soften the stool but the really important thing it does in terms of liver disease is it converts that ammonia to ammonium, which can then be excreted in the stool. This is, this is something that I've seen show up on tests often where you know, the, the, they'll give you a little case study of a patient with hepatic encephalopathy and one of the drug options will be lactulose and, or, or hyperosmotic laxatives. If you haven't studied and haven't gone through it, that makes absolutely no sense to you and you will ab you'll just get the question wrong. Um, some other option will seem to make more sense. But if you've studied and you understand what's going on with the ammonia and and understand that these, these hyperosmotic laxatives can, can get rid of some of that ammonia. That question is gonna be really easy for you. And that's that. So if you have uh, any questions about liver disease or anything we've talked about in this video, feel free to shoot me an email. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next week when we talk about shock.